A student who came to visit her family for a holiday went for a run and disappeared without a trace. The residents of the small village were shaken by this event as nothing like this had ever happened in their area before. Detectives began an investigation that lasted for many years and it was only after 28 years that everyone learned the gruesome truth that shocked the residents of the small village. Mandy Stavik was born on April 16, 1971, in the American city of Bellingham, Washington. She grew up in a large family with loving parents, two brothers, and a sister. Soon after Mandy's birth, her parents decided to move to a town called Palmer, Alaska. This place was known for its picturesque nature, safety, and the unity of its few thousand residents. The family lived in this town for several years, but when Mandy was three years old, her parents decided to divorce, and she stayed with her mother. Nevertheless, she continued to see her father almost every day. A year later, a terrible tragedy struck their family. Mandy's 17-year-old brother went on a hunting trip and disappeared. The police later found his body, which had almost 20 bullet wounds. Despite all the investigators' efforts to solve the case, they could not find any suspects. For Mandy's family, this event was a real shock, but she continued to grow up joyful and active. She excelled academically, participated in many sports, and played various musical instruments. When Mandy was 12 years old, her mother decided to move back to Washington, but this time to a small village called Acme, whose population at that time was less than 300 people, and all the residents knew each other well. There were practically no serious crimes in this place, and the woman decided that she and her three children would be better off there. Mandy enrolled in the local school, quickly made friends, continued to play sports, joined the school music group, and became a cheerleader. In addition, she loved the local nature and enjoyed going for runs towards the picturesque river. When Mandy was 17 years old, another tragedy struck her family. After the divorce, her father stayed in Palmer and started a new family, having several children, and in 1988, Mandy's stepbrother drowned in a river. It was another blow for her and reminded her of her older brother's death. After graduating from high school, Mandy enrolled in Central Washington University in 1989, which was three hours away from her home. She wanted to become a pilot and strove to get straight A's. She lived in a dormitory, but whenever she had the chance, she visited her family. At the end of November, she came home to spend Thanksgiving with her relatives and planned to stay there for a few more days. On November 24th, the day after the holiday, Mandy decided to go for a run. Usually, her mother accompanied her and rode her bike next to her, but this time she stayed home because her sister had come to visit her briefly. So Mandy set off alone, taking the family's German Shepherd with her. Her usual route started from home and ran along the road to the river, after which she turned around and ran back, totaling about five kilometers. Usually, the run took less than an hour, but this time Mandy was clearly delayed. When her brother returned home, he was surprised that Mandy was still not back. He was visiting a friend whose house was located along the road. The brother saw Mandy run back towards home, but after a few minutes, she ran in the opposite direction. He thought she had decided to do another lap, but even considering that, she should have returned home much earlier than him. As time passed, Mandy's relatives began to worry seriously about her. In addition to the fact that she had never run for so long before, she had plans for the evening. Before heading home for the holiday, she invited her dorm mate, who came with her. They were planning to go to a neighboring town that day 
to meet with friends. Two hours later, something happened that made the whole family worry even more. Their German Shepherd returned home without Mandy, which was extremely strange. The mother of a young woman who had already lost a child once decided to immediately contact the police, and despite Mandy being 18 years old, the sheriff agreed to start the search right after the woman's call. Meanwhile, the mother began calling literally every resident of the village and asking if they had seen her daughter. Upon hearing that Mandy had disappeared, many of them went out into the street and quickly organized their own search. Together with the young woman's relatives, they walked along the route she had run several times, but she was not found. Meanwhile, the police began questioning people close to Mandy. They learned that the young woman had a boyfriend named Rick, whom she had been dating since high school. The young woman's mother also said that the couple had broken up and got him back together again. The investigator spoke with him, but found no reason to suspect the young man. They questioned several other people while combing the area with the villagers. By that time, people on SUVs, horses, and helicopters had joined the search. The local dog handler even tried to work with a shepherd dog, hoping that it would lead them to Mandy. However, the dog was clearly frightened and did not want to leave the porch of its house. The search continued until late at night, but it yielded no results. The next day it continued, and the police managed to find the first worrying clue. Volunteers found women's sports pants on one of the back roads. They were covered in mud, looked old, and had several holes. The pants were immediately shown to Mandy's mother, but she hesitated to say that they belonged to her daughter. Despite this, the police still sent them to the laboratory. Experts found traces of male semen on them. Detectives immediately asked for DNA samples from all the men who were familiar with Mandy and were in the area, but no matches were found. The FBI's general database, which contains DNA of convicted criminals, did not exist yet that year, so investigators could not do anything with this clue. Meanwhile, specialists with search dogs began to participate in the search, and soon they discovered a new lead. They managed to find traces of the young woman on the dirt road, as well as the tracks of her sheepdog. But there was one strange moment. Their tracks stopped at the same place. From this, only one conclusion could be drawn. Mandy must have gotten into someone's car. Detectives suggested that she may have been abducted and forced into a car, but experts disproved this assumption as there would have been a different scene at the point where the tracks ended, as the young woman should have resisted. In reality, it looked as though she got into the car of her own accord, meaning that the driver could have been someone she knew. On the third day of the search, police, along with firefighters, began searching the nearby river that flowed alongside the road where the young woman was last seen. There, they made a distressing discovery. About five kilometers downstream from the village, they noticed a female body in the water. After retrieving it, they immediately realized that it was Mandy, as she was naked except for her socks and sneakers. The police did not see any serious injuries, except for several large scratches on her legs. In connection with this, they began to speculate if the young woman could have drowned. But this version made no sense. Firstly, it was the end of November, and the water in the river was very cold, so Mandy could not have gone into it voluntarily, especially without clothes. In addition, the depth of the river in that place was significantly lower than human height, and the young woman could have stood there safely. Medical experts examined the victim's body and found a head injury, which was most likely caused by a strong blow. However, they determined that this injury could not have been the cause of death. In the end, the experts concluded that the young woman died of suffocation in the water, 
In other words, she drowned. In addition, the medical experts found evidence of violence against the victim and were able to extract biological material from the perpetrator, as well as detect male DNA under the victim's fingernails. Based on all this, the police developed the most likely version of what happened. Someone kidnapped Mandy on the road, dragged her into a car, and drove her to the river, where an unknown perpetrator subjected her to violence. After that, the young woman managed to escape, evidenced by the scratches on her legs, most likely caused by prickly vegetation along the riverbank. At some point, the criminal caught up to Mandy, hit her on the head, and threw her into the water. Forensic experts identified a DNA profile and compared it to samples from everyone who was in any way connected to the case. In total, they checked over 30 men, but no matches were found. Police continued to search for any leads by questioning all residents of the village and surrounding areas. Apart from Mandy's brother, another Acme resident saw her on the day of her disappearance. The man parked near his house and saw the young woman running along the road. When she disappeared from view, a dark pickup truck drove past. At that moment, the man did not attach any importance to it. But after Mandy's murder, he shared his observation with the police. He could not remember the model of the pickup truck and refused to provide detectives with his DNA sample. This behavior seemed suspicious and they obtained a court order to compel the man to give his DNA. However, it did not match the sample found on the victim's body. The murder received active media coverage, and in the first few months, police received several thousand tips. Unfortunately, they all led to dead ends, and as a result, the investigation dragged on for years. Detectives were unable to identify any serious suspects, although they continued to actively consider various candidates. At some point, investigators speculated that an unknown serial killer known as the Green River Killer might be behind the crime. He was suspected of killing dozens of young women and he often dumped their bodies in rivers. However, no evidence in favor of this version was found even when the killer was caught and his identity became known, investigators could not link him to Mandy's murder. Due to the lack of evidence and new suspects, the investigation of this case stopped for many years. Periodically, detectives retrieved it from the archives, trying to find some fresh ideas, but it did not produce any results. In 2009, 20 years after Mandy's death, a new detective from the local police department reopened the investigation. Given that no new evidence had emerged over the past two decades, he decided to take a different approach. Together with his colleagues, they went around the entire village and surrounding areas, asking every male resident to provide their DNA sample. The detective's plan was quite simple. He understood that the killer of Mandy was most likely a local resident, and if they collected DNA samples from literally every man, there was a decent chance of finding the culprit among them. Considering that there were only a few hundred men living in the village and its surroundings, this task seemed quite straightforward. But in practice, it turned out to be much more difficult. It took the police a whole four years to check all the men, and in the end, they didn't get a single match. The detectives realized that in 20 years since the murder, the killer could have moved somewhere else, or even died. So, they began to dig through archives and try to track down literally every man who lived in the area at the time of 1989. In 2013, the police received an unexpected lead. Two women who grew up in the same village as Mandy went to a water park with their children. As they chatted, they remembered the infamous murder and began to discuss it. At some point, one of the women said that she suspected who might have killed Mandy. 
The other replied that she also suspected a specific person. And they both named the same name, Timothy Bass. At the time of the murder, he was 21 years old and lived just a few houses away from the victim. The women were shocked that they had been suspecting the same person all this time. But even more interesting were the reasons why they considered Timothy to be the culprit. One of the women said that Timothy had been hitting on her when they were teenagers. Once, when she was in a car with Timothy and some other friends, he began to aggressively pursue her and make advances. The other friends intervened and since then, the woman had been seriously afraid of being near this person. The second woman's story was even more shocking. Several years after Mandy's murder, when the woman was already living with her husband and their newborn baby, Timothy knocked on her door one evening while her husband was at work. The woman was not surprised by his visit since he and her husband were friends. Timothy said that he had been passing by after hunting and needed to use the phone. The woman let him in, but Timothy started to behave strangely. Instead of making a call, he stood there with the phone in his hand and then put it down. He then began to tell the woman that he had been in love with her for a long time and offered to engage in a sexual relationship. She refused and demanded that he leave, but Timothy continued to insist aggressively. The woman then threatened to call the police, and only after that did he leave their home. Sharing these stories, they decided to go to the police together and talk about their suspicions about Timothy. When asked why they waited so long, the women replied that they were not sure of his involvement in the murder. In such a small community, they would never be forgiven if they accused an innocent person of murder, so none of them dared to share this information. Detectives immediately became interested in this person and noticed something interesting. During the initial investigation, none of their colleagues interviewed Timothy or asked him to provide a DNA sample. This was very strange. The young man did not appear in old police reports despite being acquainted with the victim, living nearby, and his house being next to the same road that the young woman ran on. Digging deeper, investigators also found that Mandy was friends with his younger brother, Tom. Another suspicious moment was that Timothy moved to another city less than two months after the murder. Perhaps this was the reason why the guy remained out of the police's sight. At that time, they were busy with a huge amount of leads and checking people who voluntarily cooperated with them. Timothy settled in the town of Emerson, located 40 kilometers from his old home. Shortly before moving, he married and eventually had three children. Opening his criminal history, detectives found another alarming fact. In 2010, his wife filed a statement with the police that Timothy had beaten her and their children, but the investigators were most surprised by one small detail contained in this statement. In it, his wife described why Timothy was a danger to their family. Among the stories of domestic violence, she briefly mentioned her husband's strange behavior. While watching documentary crime films, when they watched similar programs together, Timothy constantly criticized criminals for how poorly they commit murders, leaving behind a lot of evidence. The man also loved to say that he would never make the same mistakes and would not have been caught. After studying all this information, the detectives began to seriously consider his involvement in Mandy's murder. They went to his house to ask a series of questions and request a voluntary DNA sample. And that's when the most interesting part began. Timothy claimed that he did not remember the crime and could not even remember who Mandy Stavick was. This statement immediately made detectives doubt his words. First of all, all the residents of the village with a population of less than 300 knew each other. Secondly, Timothy lived just a few houses away from the Stavick family, and it was simply impossible to imagine 
that he did not know her. Moreover, after the murder, this case was talked about not only in the village itself, but also in all neighboring towns. It was the first such crime in the area in many years, and for local residents, this topic remained number one for many months. Therefore, detectives did not hurry to believe the man's words, and they asked him to provide a DNA sample. But Timothy refused, which aroused even more suspicion. Unfortunately, they had absolutely no evidence that could link him to the murder, so investigators could not obtain a court order that would require the man to provide his DNA. Then, they decided to go another way. Detectives found out that Timothy had worked as a courier at a bakery located in a neighboring town for many years. They went there and talked to the manager, asking him to provide them with information about Timothy's routes for the next few days. The police planned to track him and get some item on which the man could leave his DNA. They did not tell the manager which particular crime their employee was suspected of. Detectives only said that an investigation was underway, but the woman refused to provide this information without the permission of higher management. The police contacted them and they demanded a court order. Thus, investigators were again at a dead end. They continued to study Timothy's biography and tried to find new clues that would allow them to obtain the much needed court decision, but all their attempts led to nothing and the case was stalled for several more years. In 2015, the police came to his house again, asked a few questions, and requested a DNA sample, but he refused again. It continued until 2017, when something unexpected happened. A woman named Kim Wagner, who was a manager at the bakery, went to a bar with her husband and friends, all of whom used to live in Acme, and were around the same age as Mandy when she was murdered. At some point, they started talking about the case, which had haunted the locals for decades. Suddenly, one of the friends mentioned Timothy Bass, who lived near the victim's home, and it dawned on Kim when the police came to her workplace and asked for information about his whereabouts. She didn't even think it could be related to Mandy Stavick's murder. And then Kim started thinking that if her colleague was the killer, this thought stayed with her for a long time. At some point, detectives came to her workplace again, hoping that she had changed her position since their previous conversation, and their hope was justified. Kim invited the investigators to her office and asked directly, do they suspect Timothy of killing Mandy? The police were surprised, but did not deny it, and then the woman provided them with all the necessary information and interesting observations about her colleague. She had known the man for many years and always found him strange. When one of her friends mentioned that Bass lived near Mandy's home during those years, she began to seriously consider his involvement in the case, so she decided to help the investigators. The detective started following Timothy and new difficulties emerged. He always wore gloves at work, which prevented experts from taking a DNA sample from objects he touched. The man also did not smoke, so the police could not even obtain a cigarette butt with his saliva. Bass did not even have a workplace in the bakery since he worked exclusively on delivering products. In addition, another strange fact complicated the investigator's task. Timothy never threw away his garbage at work. He stored it in his van and took it home. The detectives immediately realized that such behavior could not be a coincidence. Apparently, Timothy understood that the police suspected him of Mandy's murder and started making sure that they did not get any items with his DNA. But in the end, the detectives were lucky to find out that they couldn't obtain the suspect's biological material, Kim offered to help. Laws work in such a way that police officers are not allowed to ask third parties to obtain evidence for them. In such a case, the evidence will not be admissible in court, 
even if the suspect's guilt is obvious. However, if any person voluntarily hands over evidence to the investigators, they have the right to accept and use it. Thus, Kim offered to obtain some DNA samples from Bass, and the detectives waited. The suspect was very careful, and it took the woman a long time to achieve her goal. Only after three months did she see the man drink coke from a plastic cup and then throw it away in the trash with the can. Kim waited until Timothy left, took both pieces of evidence, and handed them over to the police. They immediately sent the can with the cup to the laboratory, and the experts extracted a DNA profile from them. It fully matched the biological material found on Mandy's body. Having finally obtained the long-awaited evidence, the police immediately went after the man and arrested him. 28 years after the murder, the suspect was finally charged. During the interrogation, Timothy denied his guilt until the investigators told him about the DNA sample match. Hearing this, the man immediately changed his story and said that he and Mandy had a secret affair. They supposedly started dating many months before her murder and had to hide their relationship from everyone because she had a boyfriend. According to Timothy, on the day of her death, Mandy came to his house during her jog. They had an intimate encounter, and she left. He added that his father was at home at the time, but it was impossible to use him as a witness since he had passed away long ago. The detectives did not believe this story for a second. In their opinion, Timothy made up the whole story about the secret affair just to explain the presence of his DNA on the victim's body. Moreover, as proof of his words, he referred to his deceased father who could not refute this information. Investigators talked to Mandy's relatives and friends and they all expressed complete confidence that the young woman would never date Timothy. He was very strange avoided communication with other people, and spent most of his time alone. The detectives decided to speak with Timothy's wife, despite the fact that the woman had filed statements against her husband and lived separately, they were still married. Here the police were waiting for another interesting turn. The woman suddenly said that on the day of Mandy's murder, she was with Timothy at his house and he was there all day. The detectives did not believe her story, but her words created possible difficulties for the court. On the other hand, they contradicted Timothy's version, according to which Mandy came to his house on the day of the murder and had an intimate relationship with him. The trial began in May 2019. Timothy's lawyer continued to insist that his client was innocent and that his DNA got on the victim's body as a result of a consensual intimate contact. The prosecution, however, insisted that there was no evidence to support this version. Timothy never called Mandy, never wrote her notes or letters, and no one among the witnesses saw them together. It was much more likely that Bass had a one-sided crush on the young woman and was even obsessed with her. Investigators found out that the guy started attending all the sports matches when Mandy joined the school team. Before that, he had absolutely no interest in sports. In addition, his windows overlooked the road where the young woman was running, and he could watch her during her runs. Apparently, that day, he decided to talk to her and caught up with her. Perhaps the guy started to harass Mandy, but the young woman resisted or he persuaded her to get into his car on some pretext. Later, Bass took her to a deserted place, subjected her to violence, and then the young woman managed to escape. The guy caught up with her near the riverbank, hit her on the head with some object, and threw her body into the water. Timothy's wife testified as a witness in court, who by that time had already divorced him, and this time she surprised everyone again. Instead of sticking to her original story, the woman told a new one. According to her, 
She did not remember that she was at Timothy's house on the day of the murder. The woman added that Bass had forced her to lie to the police during the first interrogation. Otherwise, he could go to jail. At that time, she seriously feared that her husband might harm her or her children, so she agreed to lie to the police. This deprived the suspect of his only alibi, but the court heard even more interesting details. Tom's younger brother told that after Timothy was asked for a DNA sample, he started to get very anxious about it. When Tom asked him what was going on, his brother told him the same story about a secret affair with the victim. Timothy also asked him to tell the police that he had also had a sexual relationship with Mandy, but Tom refused to lie. Even Timothy's own mother testified against him when she visited him in jail and he passed her a note asking her to lie to the police that they had gone to the store together on the day of the murder to buy Christmas gifts, but she refused to lie. In the note, Timothy also asked her to testify against his own father and try to convince investigators that he was the real killer. After all this, the defendant's lawyer tried to convince the jurors that Timothy's DNA sample had been obtained illegally. He insisted that the police had asked a civilian to obtain the man's biological material outside the rules. However, Kim Wagner refuted these claims and said that she had offered her help to the police. In 1989, this murder deeply shook her and she continued to think about it regularly for decades. Learning that her colleague was a suspect, she wanted to help solve the case. Moreover, by that time, she already had a daughter and Kim could barely imagine what Mandy's mother felt during those years. The trial lasted several weeks and after all the evidence presented, the jury found Timothy Bass guilty of murder. He was sentenced to 27 years in prison with the possibility of applying for early release after 24 years. Mandy's mother, who was 83 years old at the time, thanked the detectives for their work. Although she had lost two children in her life, she was still glad that the guilty party had been punished. In 1990, Mandy's relatives established a scholarship in her name at the high school where she attended. They continue to support this program to this day, annually awarding the most talented students who study music. The foundation of this scholarship was $25,000 collected by the residents of Acme and other towns. Initially, this money was offered as a reward for information, but after the case was solved, it was decided to put it into this program. Share your opinion on the story in the comments and don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching.